Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Schalter. It's wonderful to be here with you today. I'm a pastor of a church in New York City called Hope Chelsea, and my wife, Stanzi, and I were at Mercy Vineyard from 2015 to 2019. We love you, and we love this church, and it is my honor and delight to be able to be here with you this morning and minister God's Word. I just wanted to say thank you to Pastor Leo and Pastor Gary. It was wonderful to get to connect with them at the Vineyard National Conference at the end of the month of October, and I was actually already going to be in town this weekend, and when Leo, who's my buddy from when I was at uh, Mercy, found out, he said, hey man, I think I've got the pulpit this week, so why don't you take it? Um, and Pastor Gary warmly approved, uh, for which I'm just so grateful. I know that you guys have had a big celebration in the last couple of weeks, celebrating Pastor Gary's installation as your lead pastor. It's just such an exciting time at Mercy Vineyard, and I'm so grateful to be able to be here this morning and minister God's word to you. Thank you so much to Leo and Gary for allowing me to be here. God bless you both. I know a story of uh, a woman who was at work one day and uh, she got up in the middle of her work day and uh, went up to sort of the water cooler area and was just sort of chatting with some co-workers and uh, during that time she started talking to someone who she didn't know. Uh, she hadn't interacted with them before and as the conversation progressed it became sort of clear that this person actually knew her and knew some significant information about her and actually this person began to reveal right there in the middle of the workplace uh, a number of relational failings that this woman had experienced and participated in in her life right there in a public place. I wonder how you would feel if something like that happened to you. If someone came up to you and started exposing some of your deepest, darkest secrets, your greatest shames and griefs and failures in a public arena, how would we handle that if someone did that to us in our workplace or in our home or increasingly these days over social media or on the internet? What sort of feelings are you even feeling right now as you imagine that happening to you? It's interesting. I'm assuming that many of us would start responding with feelings of fear and protectiveness, maybe even panic. But it's interesting, of course, isn't it, that we experience that? Because don't we say things like, the truth will set you free? Don't we have this belief that the truth coming out is probably always a good thing? Whether it's coming out about society or someone else or about us? And there's some incongruity there, isn't there? between the idea that we wouldn't want someone to tell the truth about us in some arena, but that we would tell other people that the truth is always a good thing, that will set us free, that will bring us life. Why do we feel that way? How do we navigate our need for truth and all of the good things that truth and truth-telling bring into society and our life? How do we navigate that need with our own self-protective instinct? and the deep shame that we feel when the truth about us is exposed. These are some of the questions that we'll be asking and answering today. You've been walking through a sermon series over the last couple weeks called Not Too Late, where you've been searching the scriptures for biblical wisdom and revelation about ways in which it's never too late in our lives for God to work in our lives or grow us. And today we'll be looking at the question of how it's never too late in our lives to tell the truth. I've titled today's sermon, Not Too Late, to tell the truth. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just pause and invite you here. God, I, I know you're here. We know you're here, God, in the name of Jesus. And so we pause and invite you to come and make your presence among us even more acute, more delightful, God, even more fragrant. And Lord, even now at this early hour as you're speaking to us, we may be experiencing some fear, some shame, some hiddenness around some truths about ourselves that we don't want to tell and that we don't want other people to tell. God, I ask now in your mercy and in your grace that you would be giving us the courage to just allow you to gently open those things up and lift them before you, that you might speak into them in this time that you might be able in the next 25 minutes to drop your words and your spirit and your power and your care into those places in our lives. 
And God, if you're going to do that, you need to minister your word in power. And, and no one, God, can minister your word but you. So I need you to pour your Holy Spirit out on me now. Pour your spirit out on me now, God, to preach and teach your word. And God, would you pour your spirit on all of those gathered here today, all of those listening and engaging with this word, God, would you pour your Holy Spirit out, God, that we might be empowered to receive the things that you have for us today. God, we ask for all of these things in the beautiful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture passage for today is from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. I'll read the text aloud. I'm reading from the ESV translation. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people, their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness. Nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, chariots they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale, like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter like the, through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? God's truth-telling is coming. God's truth-telling is coming. That's one of the first things that we see and experience in our text today. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2 of the book of Joel, the prophet Joel talks about something called the day of the Lord. He says in verse 1, the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. And the day of the Lord, uh, that language was Old Testament prophetic expectation language for talking about a great and final day. When God would come, his authority would, would uh, rush into the world and be all in all, without contest, without competition, he would silence every other voice, and then God would judge and reveal what had happened in the world and set things right. Now, often when we think of the category and concept of judgment, we can think of something that is uh, distasteful to us or sort of petty or vindictive, but that's not what biblical judgment is, and that's not what the day of the Lord is about. The day of the Lord is about judgment as truth-telling. As God finally, without competition, without confusion, telling the truth, about what's gone on here. That's what God is going to do. It's a turning on of the lights so that people can see reality for what it is. It's truth-telling. It's not petty, vindictive, judgy God. It's truth-telling. Telling the truth. And God's truth-telling is coming. This is what the text tells us in verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy hill. The image here from the ancient world is one of a watchman standing on the wall looking for a threat or an opportunity coming from a long way off to an ancient city. And here the prophet casts the image of the watchman as one who says God's truth-telling is coming. I can see it from a long way off. And so the watchman blows the trumpet to let people know that this day is coming. And when we think about God's truth-telling coming, we can have a number of responses show up in our own lives. Sometimes we try to silence that voice. We try to not allow God's truth to speak to us or to the world. We say, uh, I'm just going to ignore that voice or silence it. I don't really want to engage with it. But ideally, we would tremble. That's what verse 1 says. It says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. And we both do and don't tremble at times when we experience God's truth and God's truth-telling. We do tremble when we think about being exposed, when we think about our secrets coming into the light. 
But we don't tremble in that we sort of have something of an attitude these days of saying, people can't tell me what to do. People can't tell me anything about myself. And whenever someone might try to come into our lives with any sort of word, even a word of care or wisdom or gentle correction or rebuke, we say, you can't tell me anything. You, can't, you don't know me. I'm the only one who gets to say things challenging to myself. No external voices get to say challenging things to me. And as a result of this, we can avoid and run from God's truth-telling. Because the reality is that the proclamation of God's truth-telling about the world is actually a very dark and gloomy proclamation. That's what the text says in Joel chapter 2, verse 2. It says, The day of the Lord, the day of God's truth-telling, is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And the description goes on. Now, we might bristle at that at first. I can imagine some of us would hear this and say, what a gloomy, pessimistic, real bummer way to read the world. That when God comes and tells the truth about the world, it's going to be a day of darkness and gloom. And if you're thinking that, I I can uh, commiserate with that. I feel like I can understand that to some extent. Some of us have experienced religious ways of speaking or religious language that have been overly judgmental or dour. And if that's you, God bless you and be with you. And I would just encourage you to continue to lift that up to the Lord even now. But the reality is, is that our world is a dark world. It is a gloomy world and it's bad. It's not just dark and gloomy, but it's spreading. The darkness is catching and it's growing on an unthinkable scale. I'd like to walk through a couple examples of that just in case you have any doubt that that's actually the truth about our world and our reality. Our world is dark and gloomy. It's a dark and gloomy world that would engage in the scourge of sex trafficking. I don't know if you've done any research about the grotesque and egregious evil of sex trafficking that happens all around the world today. In 2016, there were more than 4 million victims of sex trafficking. 1 million of them were children. 99% of them are women and girls. And the profits of the sex trafficking industry are upwards of $99 billion a year. In other words, it's very in demand. Pornography complicates things, but one site in 2020 was hosting tens of thousands of monetized videos. In other words, they're, they're getting money through ads for every click that they get on the video. Tens of thousands of monetized videos of violent and degrading acts being performed on minors and children. One mother found her runaway 15-year-old in 58 videos on this porn site. This is just one symptom, an artifact of the dark and gloomy reality that we live in. It's not just, however, that it's dark and gloomy, it's that it's spreading. The darkness spreads from one another like a disease. Uh, One perspective from uh, psychology writes about the way in which psychologically we spread sin and violence to one another. Some people think that violent acts occur somewhat randomly, but the research evidence does not support this assumption. Violence occurs in clusters, often among individuals in the same social network. People exposed to contagious diseases can develop a wide spectrum of possible outcomes from no disease at all to chronic or relapsing syndrome to disability and death. The same is true for people exposed to violence. Not everyone exposed to violence becomes violent themselves, but people exposed to violence are much more likely to become violent themselves than people not exposed to violence. Our sin, our violence, the way we wound one another, it's catching, it spreads. And in a cruel twist of our dark world, it spreads in some of the most poignant ways when someone is wounded and then that wounded person turns around and wounds others. This happens in social and systemic ways through the way oppression is spreading. And one group oppresses another group and that group turns around and oppresses another group in response. The Korean-American theologian Andrew Sung Park, author of a book called The Wounded Heart of God, writes this about the irony of the way in which oppression rolls downhill, particularly in the context of the practice of foot binding in China. This is what he writes. He says, the irony of this is that women carried out the practice of foot binding other women. This is part of the paradoxical structure of the world in which the oppressed victimized other oppressed individuals and people who are defenseless and vulnerable. The darkness in the world 
spreads. It's catching. Finally, it's growing into unthinkable degrees, like the evil of pollution and a lack of stewardship in our climate. I don't know if you've read any statistics or seen any pictures uh, related to evidence about plastic in the oceans. In 2015, there were 150 million metric tons of plastic in the ocean. By 2040, people predict that there will be 600 million metric tons of plastic in the ocean. That means by 2040, 29 million metric tons a year of plastic will be floating into the ocean. Can you even imagine 600 million metric tons? I can't. I can't even imagine it. But this is exactly what Joel chapter 2 verse 2 says about our experience of God's proclamation of truth at the day of the Lord. He says, there has never been like it before nor will be again after them through all the years of generations. It'll be unthinkable. The scope of the darkness and the scope of darkness that's spreading in our world today is unthinkable. And as a result of these things, we find ourselves in a place of difficulty and challenge, don't we? Because we both want truth-telling. We want truth to be told about the darkness in our world, about these ugly and disgusting and grotesque things that we've just looked at. We want the truth to be told about injustices in society, historical abuses. We want the truth to be told about what has gone on here and what's gone wrong. And at the same time, we don't want truth telling. All the darkness and gloom that we just looked at, that's just a fraction. It's just a drop in an ocean of blood and tears and darkness. Who really wants to look that square in the face? Who would survive if we looked it square in the face? And that's just on a grand societal perspective. What about truth telling about ourselves? We want truth to be told over here, but do we really want the truth to be told about ourselves? Sitting in our seats right now or at our homes with other people, do we want the truth to be told about ourselves? We both do and don't want the truth to be told. And if we're honest, we probably lean towards, out of a self-protective impulse, the ways that we don't want it to be told about ourselves or about things in the world that are inconvenient to us. But into that problem, Joel speaks another reality. There is no hiding from God's truth-telling. As much as we don't want the truth to be told, as much as we want these things about ourselves or some things about our world to be swept under the rug, there is no hiding from God's truth-telling. Nothing escapes God's truth-telling. In Joel chapter 2, verses 3 through 9, the image of a locust plague is used to describe the exhaustiveness of the scope of the day of the Lord, and as a result, the scope and efficacy of God's truth-telling. In verse 4, we see the image of the locust plague uh, as an utterly complete judgment. Uh, so, uh, for example, in verses 3 to 4, the text says, Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate waste behind them. Nothing escapes them. Nothing will escape the plague of locusts. The locust plague is identified as an image of ways in which we cannot hide. We can't outrun the locust plague and we can't outrun the truth. In verse 4 and 5, the text says, Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, like war horses they run, as with the rumbling of chariots they leap on the tops of the mountains. They're too fast. They're too swift. And God's truth-telling and the truth and the pursuit of the hiddenness of our lives is too swift. It's too fast. There's no outrunning it. The image of the locust plague is described as powerful. We can't block out the truth. We can't wall it out. Verse 7 says, Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They don't swear from their path. Verse 9, uh, in, in, in shockingly rapid imagery, it says, They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. It's like we're, we're trying to block out the truth and, and, and put these, these uh, bricks up in our lives to create these walls to, to keep these hard truths out of our lives. But even as we're stacking the bricks, the locusts are on them. They're running along the walls. They're coming in through the windows. 
We can't keep them out. It's too exhaustive. They're too fast. We can't block them out. And finally, the verdicts themselves are full of integrity. The locusts don't stumble. They don't trip over themselves. Verses 7 and 8 says, They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. The image that's being used here is an image of an ancient Near Eastern army that is impeccably trained, that as it moves on its way towards its destination, towards its enemy, it does nothing to hinder its own progress or make itself less effective. We see this image repeated in a text like Isaiah chapter 5, verses 27 to 28. This is what that text reads, uh, speaking of a foreign army. None is weary, none stumbles, none slumbers or sleeps. Not a waistband is loosed, not a sandal strap broken. Their arrows are sharp, their bows are bent, their horses' hooves seem like flint, and their wheels like the whirlwind. The army's so effective. It's doing nothing to undermine its own cause or purpose. And here the locust plague is an imagery for the way in which the day of the Lord has its own internal integrity, and nothing at all will work, will work against it or undermine any of its verdicts. We can't outrun God's truth-telling. It's too exhaustive. It's too fast. We can't block it out. It has too much integrity. There isn't any escaping God's truth-telling. And as a result, we experience great anguish in the face of the sure coming of God's truth-telling. Verse 6 of chapter 2 of Joel says, Before them peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale. We're in anguish looking at the exhaustiveness of God's truth-telling, knows that once the whole truth comes out about what's gone on here, how we've participated it, and what personal things we as individuals have contributed to what's gone on, that no one will be able to stand. Corporately, the nations are in anguish that no nation or society or structure will be able to stand. And individually, the text says, every face grows pale. Each individual face. It's like uh, Paul writes in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know this should be true. Who then can stand when God tells the truth about all the things, societally, historically, corporately, and presently and individually that have gone wrong in the world? Who will be able to stand when God tells the truth about the egregious history of slavery in the world? about the egregious histories of occupation and colonialism, about the subjugation of women, about the systemic elimination of children. Who will be able to stand when God tells the whole truth about those evils? Who will be able to stand as an individual when God reveals and lays bay before everyone our lies, our selfishness, our greed, theft, exploitation, manipulation? Who will be able to stand? And so our faces are pale and rent with anguish. No one will be able to endure God's truth-telling. This is what Joel says in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble. The Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Nobody. We can't endure it. And maybe some of you find yourself in that burning present experience right now, knowing that you're running and hiding from something in yourself, in your community, a truth that has yet to be told that you know you will not be able to endure it once it's spoken. That's where we are. No one will be able to endure God's truth-telling. We're stuck, finding ourselves in some arenas, fervently desiring the truth to be told about the world, what's gone wrong here, what's unjust, and yet at the same time with great fear and panic, utterly avoiding the truth being told about ourselves, who we really are. And we go to great lengths to conceal these inconvenient truths, knowing that we will be unable to stand if they are pronounced. We find ourselves like Billy Joel singing in his song, Honesty, both crying out for honesty in our lives and in the world, and at the same time participating in and contributing to untruth. 
The song reads, Honesty is such a lonely word. Everyone is so untrue. Honesty is hardly ever heard, and it's mostly what I need from you. Aren't we in that place of contributing to both of these at the same time? Living in a world that's characterized by untruth and contributing to untruth, and at the same time knowing how badly we need honesty about the world, about society, and about us in our own lives. But we won't be honest about our own lives because the cost is just too great. The anguish is too high. The lostness, the rack and ruin that we would feel and experience as our deepest, darkest secrets and failures and losses and griefs are exposed. The cost is just too high. And so we're afraid. We're bound and caged by a fear about the honest truth about ourselves being pronounced. We need to be freed from the fear of the truth being spoken about us. We need to be freed from fearing the truth about ourselves. Imagine how good it would be for your life and for the world if you didn't fear any more the truth being told about yourself. Individually, we would have no fear about the worst parts of ourselves being exposed. We'd be able to stand up under that fear and live honestly before ourselves and other people, finally truly known, not performing anymore, not putting up that face that we do or that nice way of being, but just being honest. Societally, if we weren't afraid anymore about the truth about ourselves, we wouldn't have any fear in naming and owning and repenting and confessing of our worst moments in history. If we could stand up under that fear, we could speak historic truth and work towards a better present. How good it would be to be free from fearing the truth about ourselves. You know, the story that I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon actually comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And a Samaritan woman went to the water cooler of her day, the local well, and started drawing water in the middle of the day. And Jesus came up to her and prophetically knew truths about her life and started speaking them and sharing them publicly. I mean, can you imagine that happening to you? If someone in a public place just started saying out loud, naming these things that you had hidden away, that were causes of your deep and dark shame. And Jesus does this. He goes right up to her and starts naming these things. And it's so surprising because actually at the end of the conversation, the woman recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. She's had a great experience of him, apparently. And she starts to run around to her neighbors, to all the other people in the town. And she starts telling them, I, I met this guy, I met this guy, you've got to come see him, you've got to come see him. And, and she has a phrase in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 39, that encapsulates the central message of the Gospel as she experienced it from Jesus. And she's running around and she's, she's sharing with all these people this one line over and over again. Do you know what that line is that she says? Do you know what it is? She runs to everyone and she says, you've got to come meet this guy. He told me everything I ever did. He told me everything I ever did. Why is that good news for her? Would that be good news for you? If someone came up to you and knew all this information about you? Telling you everything you ever did? I, I, I think I would feel scared by that or panicked, maybe attacked. Why on earth would she see that as good news? She sees it as good news because finally she met someone who knew everything she ever did and invited her into life anyways. Jesus knew everything she ever did and he invited her into life anyways. And he knows everything you've ever done. And he invites you into life anyways too. Jesus sets us free from fearing the truth about ourselves because he tells us the truth 
And then he invites us into life anyways. Jesus came to save and not to judge. Joel says that when God truth tells, God will come at the head of his army. But Jesus had that opportunity and he refused to come at the head of his army. We see this in the gospel of Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, when he's talking to Pilate and he says, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? So Jesus had that opportunity. He had the opportunity to come at the head of God's army and instead he didn't and he went to the cross beaten and brutalized and dejected alone by himself. And when he did that, he accomplished two things. First of all, he allowed God's verdict to be pronounced over the world. And God help us, we need that verdict to be pronounced. Every egregious wrong, every injustice, every sin, every small deception is pronounced at the cross as what it is leading to death. It's pronounced at the cross. God's verdict and truth telling is executed at the cross about the darkness and the gloom that characterizes this world. And at the same time, Jesus stood not at the head of God's army in that moment, but at the head of humanity and allowed God's verdict to be pronounced over him that all of the pain and consequence and condemnation that should come from telling the truth about our dark reality would be whipped and beaten onto him, that he would carry that himself so that you and I don't have to. In doing this, Jesus has changed our experience of having the truth told about ourselves to an experience that leads to salvation and not condemnation. This is entirely in keeping with what Jesus meant to do when he came to this world. As John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Truth-telling is now a place of our salvation, of finally being able to go to someone who knows everything we ever did, every mistake we ever made, everything we tried really hard at and still failed at. Instead of being a place of condemnation and darkness and gloom, those now are places where we're able to say, I met someone who knows everything I ever did and he invited me into life anyways. As a result, it's never too late to tell the truth. You don't need to fear the truth about yourself anymore. The woman at the well, she thought she made too many mistakes. It was too late to tell the truth. It was too late to start living in her reality. And then along came Jesus. Along came Jesus. And all the things that she thought it was too late to tell the truth about became precisely the things that she wanted to share with other people. Because instead of becoming a place of hiddenness and death and darkness and shame, they became precisely the places where she experienced God's good news in her life. All those things she ever did became the moments not of her failure, not of her loss, not of her falling down and being unable to get up. But the places instead where Jesus said, I see that. This is the truth about it, and you're invited into life anyways. We can experience the exact same thing, and so it's never too late to tell the truth in our lives. The truth is, you are loved. Jesus took your shame, and anything can be endured and transformed when you know that God loves you and invites you into life. So today, I would love to invite some of you into that place of if there is a moment in your life or a failure or a grief or a hiddenness that's keeping you from God that you are deathly afraid of revealing, I would love to invite you 
to receive the good news that truth telling about you no longer leads to condemnation. It leads to salvation, to walking out of the darkness of distance and hiddenness from God and walking into Jesus offering you life in everything you ever did. Through his work on the cross, we can receive and be freed from shame and hiddenness. And then we will confess with the woman at the well this same gospel cry for us that we've met someone who knows everything we ever did and praise God he invites us into life anyways.